you have your Bibles this morning, would you please open them up to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to chapter 5. While you're turning there this morning, I will say welcome to everybody that's here today. As I look around the church, the church looks great. You look great. We have a lot of visitors sit here today. We thank God for you that are here and are a part of our service this morning. We want to welcome you from Harvest Fellowship. If you're your first time visitor, let's give them a hand of appreciation. Yes, thank you very much. God bless you for that. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. For the last couple of weeks, I've been ministering on the theme, on a theme. We take it from, uh, from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. It's, it's in that context there where Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. He asked them a question, and the question was this. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, of course, we know Peter answered and said that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter, in, uh, excuse me, Jesus, in response to Peter's confession, said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. Then it goes on down a little bit further in verse 19. And Jesus says this. And he says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And from that verse of scripture, we've taken the thought, kingdom keys. And I have brought to the church a couple of things in the last couple of weeks concerning significant kingdom keys that we use in the authority of Jesus' name to benefit our lives here on earth. Aren't you glad about that today? Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so today we're going to continue on that thought of kingdom keys. And we're keeping it really simple, and we're keeping it very practical, because I like that. I like to be able to apply what we're preaching about. How about you? Amen. And so, um, today I want to bring the thought of, don't look back. Amen. Amen. Don't look back. So it's <coughs> kind of simple, but as we get into this, you're going to find out that your life of faith will constantly be challenged. We, bring, uh, we sang a song here a little while ago, I Walk By Faith. And we do. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. But your faith will be challenged when you commit your life to Christ. We are in a tug of war. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. There's a lot of opposition that comes against your life when you make a decision for Jesus Christ. We all have to have our own personal experience and confession of Christ. When Jesus said to his disciples on that day, who do men say that I am? That question became a universal question throughout the ages. After Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross, went into the tomb and raised again on the third day to show himself alive, it became a universal decision from that point in time to this point in time, even to this very day this morning. Some of you here today might be in a position where you have to make a decision on who you think Jesus is for yourself. Because there's a lot of different opinions about who Jesus is. And until you come to the opinion and to the decision and to the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, until you come to that point where you recognize Him as the Savior of your soul, then you don't know Him well enough. He has to be more than a man. He has to be more than a person that you read from a book. He has to become a living, breathing, friend, Savior, Lord that becomes a part of your everyday life. That's what Jesus is to me. And that's who Jesus is wants to be to you. But once you make that decision for Jesus Christ, you start to walk in faith. You start to live by faith and not by sight. And it begins the day you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that day can be today for some of you this morning. Amen. Amen. And I hope it is. And God loves you so much that He is cheering you and hoping that it is as well. But in our scripture text here this morning, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to read some portions of scripture here and then bring a few quick points concerning the fact of why we should not look back. The temptation to a believer. The temptation and draw of someone who's made a decision for Jesus is always going to be the thought of turning around and going back. You'll, you'll be conflicted at times about Questions of life. Because even though we are saved, how many are saved today? Let me see your hand. Even though we made this decision for Jesus as our personal Savior, and we're living a life doing our very best to please Him, and we know that we are on our way to heaven, even in all of that blessing, the conflict is always going to be there. The 
Bible says that we are in a warfare. The Bible says that there is a, a lust of the flesh that wars against the spirit. And it continues on until we finally see Jesus face to face. It will never end. But the determining factor is you and me. We determine who wins by who we lend our members to, by who we decide to walk after, by what our response is when the attack comes. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Bible, New King James Version this morning. We're going to read the whole thing. For we know, say we know. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the earnest of the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather than to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body, according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are all well known to God, and I also trust, are well known in your conscience. For we do commend ourselves, excuse me, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is, is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge this way, that if one died for all, then all are dead. And he died for all, that those who should live should no longer live to themselves or for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is in the creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that it is God was in Christ reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us to implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I take my text from that 17th verse. Let me read it again from the New King James Version, listen to this. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. From this verse of Scripture, I'm going to preach to you concerning the thought of don't look at. Help me pray today. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of ministering the Word of God. Touch your people. God bless their hearts. Encourage their lives. Raise them, Lord God, with a newfound determination to go all the way with you. We thank you for the blessing of salvation. We give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 This coming Wednesday, we're going to be celebrating 50-year anniversary of the day known as the, um, um, the, 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 free, the Freedom March or the uh, Civil Rights March when there was 250,000 people marched on Washington, D.C. You guys know what I'm talking about. That's when Martin Luther King took led this march into Washington, D.C., trying to move upon the nation to recognize the freedoms that people should have no matter what color of skin they are. We know this story well. We understand what took place on that day. On that day, one of the greatest speeches ever known 
uh, was given, in which Martin Luther King began to say to say that uh, say that uh, he had a dream, he, and and that part of the dream began to ring loud and clear. Did you know today that that part of that of that uh, that uh, uh, speech was not in the original speech that he had written. It wasn't a part of his original speech. What had happened was he had a speech in which he was declaring the rights of people. And then in the midst of that, somebody said from the audience, they said, tell them about the dream, Dr. King. Tell them about the dream. And from that, he began to share from his heart what God had put in his spirit as a pastor. And he began to move in a realm where the spirit of God anointed him and began to flow in a way that it ripped men's hearts. Oh, God help us today to flow in the spirit in a way that will rip our hearts. And from there, he began to share his dream where God would begin to bring people together in unity, no matter what color skin, no matter what level of life they come from, recognize that we are all created equal under God's side, and he loves us, he loves us all the same. Amen. Amen. But is it the conclusion of that speech is one of the most profound things that he said that uh, we will remember as soon as I say it, but this is my prayer, amen, for you to grab a hold of today. He said at the conclusion of that speech, he said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. Hallelujah. This is the heart of the Father for you and me today. God wants you to know this morning that he doesn't want us to live beneath the privilege for which he has created you to live. God does not want us to be bound up. God does not want us to be depressed. God does not want us to live below the privilege of living that he has issued in your life by his spirit. But so he sent his son of the world so that whoever would believe in him would be set free. So God says, he who the son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In my text this morning, the Bible says, therefore, there is, amen, a conclusion to the matter. Because God sent his son into the world because God so loved the world. God so loved the ethnos. God so loved people that he sent his, work, his son into the world because God did not, does not, will not love it if any should perish, but he wants everybody to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from ourselves. Saved from our sin. Saved from degradation. Saved from alcoholism and drug addiction. Saved from uh, uh, all types of things that we can get messed up into. God has sent His Son into the world to deliver us from all of those things and set us free, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. Hallelujah. And so He says there, therefore, because God sent His Son into the world so that through Him we might have life, He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There are three points that I've highlighted here in this context that I want to share with you today concerning how we can walk in this newfound life. How we can be liberated from our past hang-ups and mess-ups and all of those things that go on in our life because the Bible is clear to us. We are conflicted. We are in a warfare. The Bible says, amen, that we are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. On one hand, you have the old things, and on the other thing, on the other hand, you have the new things. And we are right in the middle of both. Can somebody say, preach it on? Pastor, preach it. Hallelujah. We are right in the middle of an old life and of a new life. And we are conflicted. We are in a tug of war. Sometimes, amen. The, the, the world, the lust of the of the things of this life wants to pull us back and get us back into the mess that we got delivered out of. You have, can I get some help over here? Can somebody say? We're conflicted because of a, a, a temptation, a pull, a draw that tries to get us back into those things that God got us out of. But on this side, we've got Jesus. This side, we've got abundant life. This side, we've got peace that passes understanding. And the Lord says he's delivered us from this side to get us on this side. And somebody say glory to God. Amen. He said, therefore, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old have passed away, behold, all things have become new. That's a true statement. But just as Jesus rose from the dead, that old man that you buried back here in the old life, he tries to get up all the time. You need to keep him put down. Just keep marching on. Don't look back. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we are in the middle. And the, the, the contention will continue. But the deciding factor on who wins will depend on us. 
Hallelujah. So I want to start out by showing you a couple things here about why should we keep going forward and not look back. That we have good reasons. Number one, he says here in this fifth verse, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Yeah. What has he prepared us for? He's prepared us for a new way of living. He's prepared us for peace that passes understanding. Let me just say this real quick. This is going to help somebody today. You might have confessed Christ in your life, but God never said that you won't go through troubles. So you just might as well uh, grab a hold of that truth. Amen. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, you will have trouble. God does not save us from trouble. He saves us in our trouble. Praise the Lord. And so what's the difference? What makes the difference? Why should I be a Christian? Or why not? Why should I be just like the world? Because the world doesn't have Jesus helping them the way the Christian has Jesus helping them. God is not obligated to help the people that are not living for Him. He wants to help them, and He will help them because God will not be a respected person if they cry to Him. The only difference is we believe. We recognize who we need to call to in our day of trouble. In my, underneath the sound of my voice, we all have a day of trouble, but when my trouble comes, I can lift up my eyes, and I can look up to the hills on which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. I know where to turn, even when things are going wrong. I know who to call on, praise God. That is never late. He's never too busy, and he's always on time, praise God. Ain't not talking about Jesus Christ this morning. Hallelujah. And so he says, he who is God has prepared us for this very same thing. To walk us together in a new way of living, a new life, putting a song in my heart in the mind. And he says, who has also given us a spirit as a guarantee. That's the part I want to touch on this morning. He has given us the spirit as a guarantee. When we are in the middle of life and death, when we are in the middle of darkness and light, when it's up to us to decide who wins, we have to have some things that will assure our life that we're making the right choice. How many people want to make the right choice today? Yeah, we want to make the right choice. What is it about Jesus? What is it about God that we should choose? How do I know that there is a God? That's a question that is a fair question. How do I know that Jesus is real? How do I know that he rose from the dead? How do I know that he was God in flesh? Those, how do I know he walked on water? How do I know, praise God, that he fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves? All of these things are questions of the mind that it passes figuring out. Can somebody help me today? It passes figuring out. It doesn't even add up. In, the, in physics, in the law of gravity, in the law of just supply and demand, it does not make sense. But our ways are not his ways. And our thoughts are not his thoughts. And what God can do, amen, man cannot do. And God can be out of nothing, something, praise the Lord. But here is the point of the matter. He said God has given us an assurance as the, by giving us the spirit as the guarantee. That's the point right there. Listen to me. When we come together as a group of people, or we get alone with God and we begin to lift up our hands. And we begin to call upon His name. Just call upon His name. Just call upon His name. Just say Jesus. Just say Jesus. Just, just begin to love Him and adore Him. And just begin to worship Him because of who He is. And just begin to spend some time with Him. I guarantee you, amen, if you are in a relationship with God, and even if you're trying to find a relationship with God, if, when you're sincere to the Lord, the Lord will be sincere to you. When you are serious about getting serious with God, God gets serious about getting serious with you. And all you got to do is start calling on His name, and I guarantee you, you will feel the presence of something coming to that room. You feel something really good begin to move all over you. You feel something start to flow from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. You can call it goosebumps or chill bumps or whatever you call it. I call it Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what it is. It's not something we can make up. It's not something that we can manufacture. It's just God releasing His Word, praise God, because He said, I'm going to send you a down payment of what I'm talking about. Here's what you've got to know, church. You've got to know, praise God, that you need to appreciate the presence of the Lord. You appreciate the presence of the Lord. You appreciate the presence of God. That is the assurance that everything else that He said is true. Are you hearing me today? That assures us that everything else He said is true because I can come into the church house with my friends and with uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ and lift up my hands and start praising His name and feel, praise God, the invasion of the power of God, the presence of the Lord, the glory of His presence in the house, filling the temple, hallelujah, the rain of the temple, filling it up when I can feel glory to God, the glory 
I mean, I, sometimes it just makes me want to just cringe a little bit. You, know, you just get that. I love that. Just get that tiny. Like, okay, I can't take too much of it, but I, I really can. And you know what I'm talking about? Where God's glory just comes. I love those moves of God on my soul. Even if it just comes by, it'll just kind of have a little fluttering. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. I just want you to know I'm here today. When you acknowledge Him in all of your ways, praise God. He will shout.
And we're walking away from that old man. Amen? God is in the middle of all of that. God is in the middle of our life, walking it out with us. And here's how God views our life. He looks on our past, redemptively. Yes. And he looks on our future, prophetically. Are you hearing me today? Yes. Hallelujah. What are you talking about? I'm talking about all the things I've done wrong. When we had a tug of war, conflict in our life, a lot of battle is in our own mind. Well, I don't deserve to be blessed because I was so bad. I was so messed up. I hurt so many people. I know I've got people here that think the same way I was thinking. I know you're here today. That's the same way I was thinking. I don't deserve this. But you know what? None of us deserve it. None of us have been good enough. Only Jesus was good enough to die the death that God the Father would accept. And so the Father says, don't worry about it, Kim. I got that covered. All that mess up, all those things you did wrong in your past, it's not there anymore. Because the Bible says this, this is how God views us redemptively. He looks on our past mess ups and he takes them in his hands. And he takes them and removes them as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he'll take our iniquity and move it as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it against us no more. Hallelujah. It's like God the Father, he loves us so much that he looks at us as a brand new man. He looks at us as a brand new person in Jesus Christ. It's as if all those things I did in my past life, I never did. My slate is wiped clean. He takes my sins and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered against me no more. And then for good measure, he puts up a no fishing sign. <laughs> That's right. We got to move away. We don't want to look bad. So, so we'll, we'll, you know, what about this? What, how were you back then? No. You know, I just told you some of my past things that God delivered me from. But if you come up and ask me, many times I'll do this and say, well, did you ever do this? No. Did you ever cuss? No. Did you ever, did you ever cheat? No. Why? How can you say that? Because I refuse to go back there and fish in the pond. I refuse to go back there and bring up those old... The only time I'll refer to any of that stuff is when I'm going this way to Jesus Christ and say, thank God those things are dead and buried and in the sea of forgetfulness not to be remembered against me anymore. In Jesus' sight, I am perfect, I am redeemed, and I am on my way to heaven. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away and all things have become new. One more point is at the very last verse. It says, for he who for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, speaking about Jesus, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Prophetically, God is looking at our future. We have a good future. Amen. We have a good future. We're moving past. Give God your past because he is a forgiving God. And God has a great plan for our lives. His this is what God has called us from and has called us into. God says, I know my thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Amen. For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, some things that try to pull us into our past is the enemy. People sometimes will say, well, man, you had a bad reputation. You weren't very nice. All of these things. But the Bible tells us, praise God, that I can be accepted in God because of what Jesus has done. Man, I, sometimes, you know, I have to recognize the fact that God has not called me to perfection. God has called me to try to be perfect. But I'm not perfect. And in those times when the temptation is to turn around and be defeated and cast down and and feel like giving up, I can remember that Jesus died for me. Amen. That He is my righteousness. And in Him I stand complete. Amen. I remember a day not too long ago, I was just kind of fussing with my own self. Not that I'd done anything terribly bad, but I hadn't done everything right. Hello, somebody. You ever have that type of war going on? Not that you've done uh, terribly bad, but you haven't done everything exactly right. And I was fussing with myself over that, and the Lord just stopped me. I began to complain to the Lord about myself. I said, Kim, did I love you when you weren't with me? I said, oh, yes, you did. Lord, you love me so much that while I was at my worst state, you died for me. He said, how much more do you think I love you now that you are with me? 
Hallelujah. He loves us more now than he has ever loved us when we become a part of him. Amen. He loves you today. He wants you to know today that you can make it. You will make it. You don't have to be conflicted. You can keep moving forward. Don't look back, child of God. Don't look back. Amen. The enemy, people, accusation, there's all self-condemnation. You know, we think all the time, if I only would have done this, if I only would have said that, if I would have gone there, if I had to decide to do that, would have, could have, should have. We all have those mind games that go on in our mind. It doesn't matter in Christ. All those things have been put under the blood of Jesus at the cross. It's as if they never happened. You have a fresh start today. Amen. You might have blown it yesterday. You might have done something wrong yesterday. But you know what? Today's a brand new day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. I can walk away from my treasure yesterday and walk in the confidence of the day knowing, praise God, that the Lord has got it covered because of His righteousness. He made Him sin so that I can become the righteousness of God in Christ. You don't have, you are not perfect. God did not make you perfect when you were saved. He did not make us perfect. He declared us perfect. Are you hearing me today? There's a declaration of your life. And the declaration is simply this. Jesus said, my blood has you covered. And when the Father looks down by the, through the blood of Jesus, you are perfected in Him. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as the Father looks down upon your life right now, He sees perfection because Jesus' blood has got you covered. Amen. If you're today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I've got to tell you something this morning. You can, can, can make a decision for Jesus today at these altars and find Jesus as your personal Savior. And you will be as saved as I am. How's that possible? Because none of us are saved more than anybody else. We might be saved longer, but we're not saved more. Nobody can get saved more than somebody else. We're not more saved. We're all saved the same. And our save and our our saving, the saving of our soul comes only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. So I've come today to let you know that God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free from self-condemnation and doubt. He wants you to be free from the struggles of going back and forth, in and out, up and down. The Lord wants you to put you on solid ground today and the confidence to walk out of this church knowing that everything is going to be all right. Because you are a new creation in Christ and old things have passed away. They are in the sea of forgetfulness. They've been covered by the blood of the Lamb. You don't have to worry about condemnation and guilt. And if God has forgiven you, then I say to you today, it's time for you to forgive yourself. Start, stop letting the devil beat you up and tell you how bad you were. It doesn't matter to God. God loves you so much. He says, I've got it all covered and forgiven. And so just keep walking and don't look back. Don't look back. Katie, would you come up and play for me this morning at the end? Would you stand together on your feet with me today? The key, kingdom key today simply is don't look back. You are a new creation. Go forward to God. He loves you so much. You are more than conquered. You will win. We make that decision to stop being beat down. Forgive yourself today. Stop worrying about the things you've done wrong. Put it into God's hands. Put it into the hands of God today. Put your past into God's hands. He's a forgiving God. He'll, he forgives and He forgets. The Bible tells us this. In Philippians 3.13, it says, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and going forward into those things which are before. I've come to tell you today that the Lord wants to release you into freedom. He wants you to stop worrying. He wants you to stop fretting. He wants you to stop condemning yourself. He wants you to stop beating yourself up past failures and mistakes. God wants to set you free this morning. He wants you to know that you are free Jesus Christ. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. Yes, we mess up. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we say things sometimes that we regret and wish we had not said. But you put it in Jesus' hands. That's forgiven. That's forgotten. He says, just keep walking in me and don't look back. As you're standing at your feet this morning, you might be here today and you say, Pastor, the message has ministered to me today. It really has. That's exactly how I feel. I feel like I'm just in a place.
place where I need to just be set free from my past. I need to stop letting the past haunt me and hinder me from going forward to the things that God has called me into. I want more of the Lord. I want to be able to walk in the freedom that Christ has paid the price for by shedding His blood on the cross. And I feel this morning that I need special prayers. Thank you today. You feel like you need special prayer? Would you raise your hand today? God bless you. Yes, hands up. God bless you. Anybody? Yes, hands up. Yes, many hands up. Praise the Lord. Don't look back. Let the blood of Jesus just take your sins and throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. Put it up that no fishing sign. And don't let anybody tell you any different. God has said, Behold, I make all things new. When he says, Behold, I make all things new, that means stop and pay attention to what I'm saying. The, in, in, the, in the sentence structure of that verse, it's actually in the second tense. It's actually the voice of God himself that says, Behold, I make all things new. The church doesn't make things new. The pastor doesn't make things new. God makes things new. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, God knows how to make things new for you. We're not going to go through some type of religious exercise here. We're believing God's going to do a supernatural work that only he can do. Yeah. And when God does it, he does it. You've lifted your hand today. you asked for the Lord to do a work in your life. You need Him to come and, and set you free. Then get out of your seat and come to the front of this church. And just make a way here. You can kneel at this altar. You can stand and we'll have people pray for you. But let's believe God today. I believe God's going to set some people free. Don't look back. Stop worrying. Stop condemning yourself. Let God set you free today. Like for the pastors to come and help me pray this morning. We're going to pray today. Would you lift your hand all around there that's, that's out of the congregation? Would you stretch forth your hand this way and believe God with us this morning? People are going to be set free today. You're here today and you have not confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know that you need to make a decision today to walk forward in God. One of the key words of, of God is forwards. Don't look back. Don't go back. Go forward. Make progress in Jesus. You're here today and, and you feel like you want a special prayer. Would you get out of your seat and come? We want to pray for you this morning. These altars are open for you. Would you come?